Excellent. Okay. That's in case I forget who I am. I, I want to thank uh, everybody at the Dunlop, Wendy, uh, Jennifer, and all the amazing uh, facilitators who helped to install the project. It was rather epic. I've been here since last Friday, and um, I'm happy to say it's 99% of the way there. There's been little glitches, but hopefully you will pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. In fact, you won't even know he's there. Um, so. Uh, for the talk tonight, um, since the work is upstairs, I'm not going to talk about the work, uh, but I'm going to show you um, some uh, projects of mine over the last few years. Uh, just to give you a bit of background, I'm an architect by training. Um, I studied in Ottawa at Carleton. I, when I left Carleton, I moved out to Vancouver, but it uh, coincided with the fall of the Berlin Wall that uh, time, and so um, through a series of uh, strange circumstances, I ended up uh, in East Germany, or in former East Germany, around that time, uh, working at the uh, Bauhaus in Dessau. Uh, and I spent five years there teaching, and uh, met my uh, wife, Stephanie, there, who's also an architect. And we moved back to Vancouver, um, and were invited to build a sushi bar in Nelson 20, roughly 20 years ago did that and then just stayed because I got a job teaching at the art school there. Um, that lasted for a few years. And then um, uh, we, uh, my, my wife Stephanie and I went into business um, becoming production ceramic people. I don't know why I call us potters because we, as architects, we did all of our pieces were hand built. Um, uh, I guess it was pottery, um, and we built up that business until Stephanie decided that she was more comfortable going back to her architecture roots and as uh, pursued project management, and, uh, and once she left our business, uh, then it allowed me to pursue my interests, which were more sculptural in nature, and so um, starting in ceramic, uh, I guess around 2005 is where I'll, I'll kind of begin this, and, um, and we'll go up to today. Um, so I think I would describe my practice as kind of a journey, and so, uh, and you'll understand what I mean um, as we go through these some of these images. Um, so the first project that I did, um, that I actually managed to get shown, was a, a work called Tangible Shadows, and a lot of my work in in Germany and uh, in my teaching, uh, and in previous um, previous work that I did was focused on the environment and material use and reuse and consumption and it's a there's a kind of a pendulum swing in my practice um, I'll tend to head headlong into it with some projects and then with the next project I'll run as far away from it as I possibly can so the small project before this one was called leftover and under and dealt with the remnants of my ceramic uh, production studio and so this one was a, a, a run in the other direction and it started with this idea of these milagros which are um, these very small votive offerings made out of metal uh, that you can find in Latin America that, um, you know, there'd be a, a little, like, they're almost like the size of a charm. You have like a leg or a breast or a lung or a kidney and you, you pin them on the saint of your choice in the church as an offering of uh, thanks for prayers answered. Um, and so this piece uh, kind of started, this body of work started on that premise uh, uh, and dealt with body parts. At first um, with body parts of people who uh, had actually had accidents with their body parts, but I quickly ran out of people to experiment with and so ended up uh, working with uh, students. And you'll also see in, in, um, in these pieces and in what I'm showing you tonight upstairs that there's this um, thread that also runs through my work of wanting to veil things and reveal things in a, a more subtle way. Um, and so basically these, these are made with, um, uh, with slabs of ceramic draped over various things, uh, various body parts. Uh, in the case of this one, um, once I became comfortable working with them and made about 10 or 15 pieces, um, I wanted to work larger and uh, started working with car body parts. Um, because they, for me, they had a lot of the same uh, sort of sensual qualities that um, that human body parts had, and so this particular one was done um, over a car body part, and uh, as was this one. This was kind of a combination of a car bumper and um, and uh, human form as well. You can see in the bottom right hand corner there's a breast, and then I believe the um, the negative space there is uh, an arm, uh, the negative space of an arm. Um, 
And so, um, as is often the case, I mean, this is where the journey comes in in my work. One thing tends to lead to another. And in fact, I think the, um, one of the essays in the catalog is called uh, One Thing and Then Another. It's a title I kind of don't like, but the reality is it is how I work. And so, having had access to car bumpers and in quantities that I could never have imagined and all for free because they were damaged, um, my uh, fascination with scrap got the better of me and I started collecting them obsessively. And they take up a lot of space, as you can see. Uh, and before I knew it, I think within a month I had about 100 of them. And so for the uh, opening of the show, Tangible Shadows, I decided to create a piece just using the bumper parts, um, as well as showing the, uh, the pieces from that body of work. And at the time, um, I, it was very, very quick. I kind of had the idea within a week of the opening and produced it and installed it. And I would have, I dearly love to have done the piece in uh, International Klein Blue, uh, which would kind of uh, draw in another experience of mine in my practice, and that was a long-standing obsession with the color blue. Um, and I, I, I articulated that uh, when I was discussing with a curator about the next body of work, uh, Refuse Culture, because as I was saying before, now that I had run away from refuse and consumption, I decided in the next project to run headlong into it. And so this next project, Refuse Culture, um, indulged my desire to do those bumper pieces, uh, the bumper piece in, in blue. And with um, much of my work um, is, is done actually in residencies in, in various parts of the world because uh, I think it's important to get out, but also because I've treated it as though it's my own kind of educational experience because I studied architecture and not art. So I tend to go out and do work in, in different contexts with, and meet different people and explore their processes as well as mine. And so this next body, Refuse Culture, dealt with going to China and Denmark and uh, the United States and Medicine Hat um, and doing work in those contexts. And so I'll show you a few pieces of that. Um, this one was called Swimming Upstream and it actually uh, was a really quick response to being in China and being overwhelmed by all these people that would sweep up after you and these most beautiful um, Chinese brooms made out of bamboo uh, that you thought were handmade but soon realized that they were so identical that they had to have been made in a factory. And so this piece is really just about the gesture of that and um, I think the, the scale of it and the scale of most of the pieces in this body of work I think were my own response to um, the overwhelming uh, sort of universal quality of consumption. You see, when I, when I conceived of the project, I thought, oh, I'm going to go to China and I'm going to go to Denmark and I'm going to see things there that are clearly different and specific. And no doubt I did. But what was really overwhelming and what became really the focus of the project was actually how much of it was all the same. I mean, in the middle of this town in China, or I should say city, um, you know, they were completely ripping out the center and core of the city, which was ancient, to replace with a Walmart and a Kentucky Fried Chicken. So, uh, and, and, you know, compact fluorescent light bulbs were everywhere, and they were, when at that time, that was 2007, I think we were, we were paying, you know, $20 for them. Uh, in China, they were available for $2 or something like that. And so, not being a big fan of them, that was, I found that kind of overwhelming. And also not being a big fan of plastic bags uh, was the inspiration for this piece, which is called Bag Suite in 4-4 Time. Um, and it's essentially explored the production potential that I had when I was in China and the idea of the plastic bag. Um, and, and sort of the retail culture, which is just starting to disappear, um, of this massive sameness and, and repetitiveness that is now being replaced by, the, uh, by online uh, consumerism. And so that's kind of an homage to retail culture and the plastic bag. And so each of those pieces were cast um, and they were formed originally by pouring plaster into a plastic bag to create a uh, positive form and then that was cast again to create a form for casting these ceramic vessels. And so there's a little branding piece on there, they've got a logo on them. Um, there was um, another piece that came out of the experience in China and I will just um, if this behaves itself, I will play a video that describes that piece for you and use the microphone to, uh, <coughs> to give you some sound, because the sound is really what's critical. Can you hear anything? Yeah, we should 
Can you actually hear that? No. No. I heard this first. At the beginning, yeah. Yeah, but that's, that's fine. Um, essentially, it's what I call the machine for singing. And um, uh, it's, it deals with the idea that you know, we consume something in one place and something else happens in another that we know nothing about, a chain reaction of events. So you trigger this piece in one room by walking on a carpet with pressure sensitive switches underneath it. And without knowing it, you're actually creating a bit of a symphony in another room um, on these bowls, which were um, fake Song Dynasty bowls that had the most unbelievable sound to them. You would have heard a little bit of it here. Um, and so, um, another electronic piece. I seem to be drawn a little bit to electronics in my work, as you'll see upstairs. Sometimes it's not great. So this is the, the room where the, where, the piece, where the bowls were installed. And then um, this is the mechanism for pinging on the bowls. I had originally commissioned, I think, a couple hundred of these because I was so fascinated at the idea that you could. And there were these, and I actually found these fakers to do this for me. Um, and um, I thought I would be building a, a larger piece, and I brought a bunch of them home, and I tried them. We actually used them to eat with for a while, which is very strange because they're almost paper thin at the rim. And what we did discover, though, when doing that, was that when you banged on the side of them with a chopstick, that they all sounded differently. So I actually tuned the machine for singing so that there was a whole scale happening there, probably a little out of tune. And so each one of these installations for refuse culture dealt with um, things that, for me, are ubiquitous in our culture that we really don't have an understanding of the scale of uh, when we consume them. And, and one of the ones uh, that uh, obsessed me when I was in Philadelphia in 2008 was the cell phone. And so this piece is called Cellular Brick Road. And I, I introduced myself to people and I would say, hi, I'm Ian, do you have a dead cell phone I can have? And surprisingly enough, within two days I had 20 cell phones. And so I then spent the, the two months there casting the cell phones and, and molding them uh, into this piece. And um, I'd always had the idea that it should be on a bed of human hair because, um, you know, just maybe a little bit literally playing on the idea that people change their cell phones like the way the same way they change their hairstyles. It's slowed down a little bit now because cell phones have become so crazily expensive, but not really. Um, and so um, in this particular place, the, the piece, um, the, the final form of it, uh, being sort of playing on that idea of, of the yellow brick road. Um, when it came time to execute it, I realized that finding that much human hair and uh, collecting it and, and packaging it and being able to install and reinstall it from venue to venue was going to be a nightmare. And it happened to be around Halloween, so it ended up being on a bed of witch's hair, several dozen wigs of witch's hair, which was not meant to really refer to the Wicked Witch of the West, but I kind of, I won't let it go anyway, so <laughs> I kind of appreciated that. Um, another piece, uh, going back to the, um, uh, to the, the, the um, compact fluorescent lights, this is the piece that I did in Denmark, and it was a piece that kind of played on the idea of, um, um, of the, yeah, the compact fluorescent light, and on the idea of production, so that um, I did a series of these, in, in, uh, and so each time I cast one of these, uh, I would change the mold, and um, so I did several series of, um, I think about 25 in each series, and this just illustrates the transformation from the beginning of the mold's life to the end when the mold finally fell apart. And for those of you who are, you know, uh, who know about ceramics, you know that you're not supposed to mix plaster and ceramic materials together because um, plaster will rehydrate later and your ceramic will explode. And so I met a guy there who said, well, maybe a little bit of plaster is not good, but what happens if you mix it 50-50? And so this is an experiment with mixing plaster and porcelain 50-50 and again playing a little bit with production techniques and in a way a bit undermining them so because each one of these pieces is different. And the end product of the uh, of the piece uh, is called um, Just This Side of Dust. And the reason for that is that what happens when you mix that much plaster and porcelain together and put it in a, a kiln is that it turns into this chalky, dusty material, uh, which was a bit of a surprise to me. And um, was a bit of a surprise to everybody else. And there was rather a large meltdown in the kiln as well, which was not appreciated. Um, but the end piece was this rather large chandelier type object with, and the series of bulbs are uh, installed in, uh, in the actual order that they were made. So I think
think there's a, a close up. And they kind of have this, again, the, the, like a lot of my work, it tends to have this sickly, sweet sort of color involved that, that tends to draw one in, but the closer you get, it, it is a bit repulsive. And so they kind of have that, I like that combination. And they hang under these plastic lettuce boxes because in Denmark, at that time, in the city where I was, I could not buy a head of lettuce unless it was hermetically sealed in one of these plastic containers and I was so blown away by this that um, I had to include that in my piece because I thought Denmark was just the most forward thinking and environmentally sensitive country in the world but it was not. This is another piece, this is almost the last piece of that body of work uh, called uh, Maw which is like large gaping mouth. Uh, and it, it uh, came out of a collection of guitar strings that I've been collecting for me to know what to do with it. And it, and it was combined with the, the chance of actually finding that airplane cowling at a residency in Kelowna and fighting with another artist over whether I should get it or she should get it. But she said, since I was the guest, I got the cowling. And I knew immediately that that's what would happen with the cowling. And so there's probably there's thousands of guitar strings installed in that, in that piece. And um, the last piece in that body of work um, uh, plays a little bit with uh, uh, the idea of invention. It's called Reinventions of Convenience. And it combines uh, my, these three little sketches I did, one of the bag and one of the bulb and one of the cell phone, with um, the idea of invention and reinvention. At the time, going through one of the many airports that I went through, and. I'll say right now that I don't pretend to have a small ecological footprint. I know there's a certain amount of hypocrisy there, so um, you, we can talk about it later if you'd like. Um, but at one of the airports, I believe it was Salt Lake City, there was an exhibition of slot machines and the history of slot machines. And it was from 1880 to 1940 or something like that, and there must have been 150 slot machines. And the history of these things was that they would reinvent them literally in cast iron within months, like three to four months of a legislation changing, uh, banning a slot machine, they would change the, figura the configuration of these slot machines so that it looked like some other kind of a game. Uh, and I was just blown away that they could actually do that in cast iron with all of the machinery involved. And we're talking about old school kind of machinery. And so this piece was a large vinyl piece that was put on the wall and kind of played on the idea of slot machine and, and was called Reinventions of Convenience. And like the bumper piece that was a segue from the Tangible Shadows project to the Refuse uh, Culture project, this was again another segue for me into the new project that you're going to see upstairs called Reinventing Consumption. And um, it, uh, it again, you know, that pendulum swung away from refuse and waste toward uh, what I think to be a little bit more utopian place or optimistic place than the waste stream, and that is at that place where you invent something or create something because when you do create something you're full of this kind of uh, maybe naive or utopian optimism that you're going to change the world with your invention whether it be you know the light bulb or the microwave or whatever it is um, in my case it was a process for um, for vacuum forming ceramic that's based on the vacuum forming system that's used in wood that I had uh, I had been exposed to in the school where I was teaching and for the longest time, I couldn't figure out how to turn that into a body of sculptural work because really it's, it's a very banal invention involving a garbage bag and a vacuum cleaner. <clears throat> and it wasn't until I got a visit from my friend's son, Alistair, uh, who, um, when we were talking about this, decided that in one afternoon he would create Inventopoly for me as a gift. And in two hours, he created this most incredible um, a game of Inventopoly which had uh, the history of the invention and you'll see it upstairs, it's, uh, it's in the exhibition and it has a, a pretty good sense of humor but also an amazing, I thought an amazing history of the invention for uh, a 12 year old. Now, and, and for me it was kind of that moment of that aha moment of, that that's the way to begin this project with my garbage bag vacuum forming system uh, was to look at the idea of invention and to start from that point. And um, very quickly on in, um, I started uh, thinking about, um, um, uh, you know, looking at inventions and finding all these accidental inventions that people had found, like microwaves, pop, um, uh, post-it notes, Coca-Cola, all kinds of things that were discovered when people were looking for something else. And so I thought, well, 
maybe my vacuum forming system is something else, and I'll discover something really amazing. And so uh, that was the kind of um, um, attitude that I took to the process of this invention, because I, I didn't really expect any big surprises with the invention. Um, and so uh, when I went to Holland to start this exploration, at one of the best ceramic residencies, I was amazed that I could get in there. <clears throat> and I went there for three months. And um, I made hundreds of experiments. I experimented um, in a, in a large-scale way. Um, I experimented in a small-scale way. Um, I recorded the sounds of the vacuum because I didn't know what I was looking for. I was expecting, you know, to invent the post-it note or insulin or something like that, right? So this is one of the. This is a. Uh, this video just shows you the process of uh, of the forming, and you'll see this upstairs as well. But it was after looking at all of the documents and all of the objects, because I made about two or three hundred experiments, and then I made another four or five hundred that are in larger pieces that are made of multiples. Um, and um, so, sorry, I'm losing my train. I'm getting distracted by the video. I think that's going to be part of my next body of work, actually, the video, the screen. Um, so what you're seeing here basically is the process. And so and it, was, it was in watching this video that I kind of got that, um, the idea of for how the project would continue. So the project starts um, in a place called the inventor's room, and it ends in something called the chamber. And this is the little video clip of a sponge being vacuum formed. So and if you can hear the soundtrack, you can just hear a vacuum cleaner. Um, let's get rid of that. Multitasking is not always the easiest thing. Okay, back to here. So um, you have to also understand that when you're talking about a journey or any artist's journey, there are always distractions in that journey. And in this particular case, it's called sometimes things are exactly as they appear. And it involves um, a distraction that lasted about six months. And it began in my backyard with a cherry tree that my neighbor wanted to cut down uh, that was on the border of our properties. And it ended up in Edmonton at the Works Festival um, as a large scale installation. And um, it involved taking the cherry tree down, cutting it up into pieces, and then reassembling it into um, its original form. And it was inspired by uh, a, a text by Ronald Wright called uh, Brief History of Progress. And he was talking about uh, the, um, he was talking about the, um, the last tree on Easter Island being cut down and having been cut down probably with full knowledge that it would, uh, that it would um, result in the end of their ability to, to stay on the island. And so this piece is all about that. Um, and so it is a little bit of a distraction, but it, it's pretty much in keeping with my experience of my practice. Um, and so this was the reinstallation of the piece in Cambridge, Ontario, at Cambridge Galleries last spring. And it coincided with uh, the finalizing of this exhibition that's coming here. And that's why it's, it's stuck in there. And it's, it's no, um, it, it is intended that it's half a forest that holds up this tree and puts it back together. Just so basically put back together exactly the way it would have been if it had been cut off at the stump. And then, back to where we are, which is in the inventor's room that I was talking about earlier, um, is the division of the reinventing consumption project. And so in the inventor's room, you have a documentation of the project, of the invention of the uh, that I was talking about with the garbage bag and the vacuum cleaner. It includes all of the experiments, or some of the experiments. Um, and it's followed by a room called the antechamber. So these are just, uh, these are different installations. This was in Swift Current. The previous one was Medicine Hat. And then this is back in, in, um, in Swift Current, or in Medicine Hat. Um, and I'm not going to 
uh, dwell on this because you're going to experience it upstairs, but suffice to say, or just to reiterate, so you have the inventor's room. And it, it also, uh, as well as being uh, documentation uh, of this kind of journey of the invention, it is a bit tongue-in-cheek because I did, you know, as I was saying earlier about the piece uh, or about the invention involving a garbage bag and a vacuum cleaner, it's not, we're not talking about high culture here. Um, we're talking about very low tech. And so the inventor's room is kind of a tongue-in-cheek, overblown um, museum installation of this rather unimportant invention. Um, I think there are far better ways of forming ceramic from my limited experience of, of working in the medium. But I was interested in following the path to its logical conclusion in order to see if I could find an opportunity for where I would go with my practice. And so the second room in the, uh, in the in exhibition called the, the antechamber is kind of the logical conclusion of, of what would happen if you took that um, production technique and used it to develop uh, um, a, uh, a larger scale uh, set of pieces. And so you'll see those there. Um, the, uh, the, you'll see also, as, as in my, uh, as my shirt um, displays, you will also see a lot of lines on the on the pieces in the antechamber. And they're meant, in a way, um, to play a little bit with your visual cortex and, and uh, disorient you slightly and take you away from um, the world that we're in and bring you to uh, the chamber, which is the last installation. And uh, the chamber relates more to that breathing sponge than it does to the invention. But you'll see the relationship when you get up there. I'll leave it as a bit of a surprise, because it's, it's kind of a performative piece. and. Um, uh, the, I guess the last thing I, I think um, I, I think the last thing I want to say is uh, going back to the inventor's room and that tongue-in-cheek museological display. Um, I think one of the other reasons why it is kind of tongue-in-cheek for me is because uh, being a bit of a news and internet junkie, I'm just amazed at our obsessiveness for. Uh, irrelevant details in our culture, and so it kind of plays on that as well. Um, so um, I think um, I, I'm hoping your experience of it will be um, will reach the climax that it's supposed to when you get into the chamber. So it, essentially, that chamber is is probably where I will go with my work next. It's uh, a more electronically controlled and based piece, and in fact, it is based back in the waste stream. Um, as its contents were collected from uh, various Salvation Armies and, um, and piles in Swift Current and Medicine Hat and here in the uh, refuse pile of the Regina Public Library. So, and I think with that I should probably stop very shortly, but I'm going to show you one more piece that is again another, um, I guess, distraction, but um, it is another step along the journey. Um, and it is a piece called In Between, and it was done with uh, another artist in Nelson uh, this spring in Castlegar. And it was part of uh, what they called Castlegar Sculpture Walk. And it kind of goes backwards to a time in my own practice when I was working with the students in the Bauhaus and we were working with, um, with gesture instead of communication. And so what we have here are a series of pieces that Shane and I made as maquettes with the idea that um, uh, it was kind of a call and response. And so he would put on a piece and I would put on a piece and then he would put on a piece. And this was all in preparation for building a larger scale piece for Castle Bar Sculpture Walk. Um, and it, it um, is essentially um, involves 200 two by fours. And again, you know, in this case, um, the two by fours are, are actually being, they were donated to us and we're donating them to a trail society. It'll be up for about a year and then it's, uh, it's donated to a, a trail society in Castlegar and a trail society in Nelson and they'll use them to, to build their trails. So um, it's never a straight line, that journey, but it is a journey. Uh, I uh, thank you for coming along.